Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along and giving us this opportunity to present our company to you. Nice to see familiar faces and new faces. Uh, my name is Bernard Johnson, uh, Group Managing Director, for those who don't know. And I'd just like to give an introduction to our company, how we've progressed in the last six months, and then let Pippa and Paul take over. Paul on the financial side immediately afterwards, and Pippa on the marketing side, and then we'll come back together again for a conclusion. But basically, in the last six months, we, we've had a period of outstanding, and I think sustainable, growth. 22 million uh, we have uh, achieved in the six months, 33% up on the same period last year, which is a pretty good increase. It's a period where we've restructured the company to enable it to continue high organic growth, and we've left behind forever, I hope, the problems that we had previously, and we did let the, 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 the stock market know about those problems last year. I think we assured you at our last meeting that we had them under control. I think they have, uh, we have proved that they are under control, and hopefully left behind for good. That has incurred overhead costs and capital expenditure more than, than normal, uh, but it has been worthwhile. So the bottom line, notwithstanding those increased costs, has come out at 1.1 million after tax, which is most, much improved from previous years. Um, 5.3% of sales compared to 4.3 in the previous six months. Our dividend will be maintained at the same rate as, as the previous year and is well covered by retained earnings and cash facilities. Our drive to climb the margin ladder is beginning to bear fruit, as you can see in the results. Despite the overheads increase, we have been able to increase profits. That's mainly by improving the margin, and that will be sustained in the foreseeable future thanks to the work of Paul and Pippa on the marketing and uh, commercial side. Our growth uh, and our capital expenditure have used cash, but it's well within our facilities and I think it's well worthwhile. We're online to achieve our previously uh, stated aspiration by the end of 2020 to achieve 60 million sales, but we'll go into more detail on that after our, our uh, financial presentation, which is by Paul and our marketing presentation, which will be Pippa. So I'm handing over to Paul. Hello again, Paul Forster, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm looking after the financial commercial side of the business. Um, these are drawn from the, announce that were, the announcements that went out today, the financial results. We're looking at an increase of sales of 5.6 million, 33% on the six months the previous year. Our profit before tax, is up by four, over 400,000, another 44% to one, nearly 1 1.4 million. The operating profit before uh, tax is at 6.3%, again a half percent improvement on last year. And diluted earnings per share has jumped to 1.8p, a little bit because we had a beneficial tax charge in the period, and I'll explain a, a touch about that later. A return on capital employed, and this is the return on the six months, on the capital employed in the six months, is 11%. So we're looking at an annualised return of uh, going around the 20%, um, 22% in the, if we maintain this for the full year. As Bernard mentioned, we're maintaining the interim dividend. We have spent a fair bit of cash supporting the growth in the business, investment in working capital. Again, I'll touch that later on. And we felt it was um, sensible to keep the dividend where it was for the time being. Um, whilst we're going through this growth period. Um, and I, as, I may, as Bernard mentioned there, we've utilised £1.7 million pounds compared to last year in, in that investment in the growth of the business. Again, a little bit more about that later on. Interesting, um, showing the growth there, 33% we've talked about. Um, slight mathematical problem there, that's 21%. So what I'm saying there is that the... 22.3 compared to the 18.1 we did in the last six months of last year. We already a significant growth last year. We've continued that into this first six months, six month on six month is a 21% growth. And I think quite interesting is that uh, last bullet point there where the six months to September, the turnover is bigger than we achieved in the full year. 
ended March 2016. So in two and a half years, um, that growth has uh, virtually doubled. Um, again, operating profit, um, we're looking at 1.4 million. And again, we're looking at, compared to 2015-16, four, 500% growth on what we were achieving in a similar year period there. You know, two and a half times growth of profit on a full year two years ago. It's quite significant. And we talked about costs, Bernard. Do we've managed to hold admin costs growth in that period to 12%, but one of the significant impacts on the business has been the growth in stocks we've had to service the customers. Um, and we chose in around about March last year, we recognised that we were running out of space within our existing warehousing facilities and we chose to outsource to a third party logistics provider. So now 90% of our finished goods have been outsourced and are now being distributed by a third party logistics provider. Um, which has had an incremental cost, but has facilitated the growth in the business and helped ease some of the pressures on the production capacity problems we mentioned last year because space constraints were part of the part of the issue that we had and did impact on us. So, so there's been, we'll talk about some of the investments later on. Did the pre and post price profit margins there? And I, the, the, again, the 0.5% growth in the period to 6.3%. And the tax charge is low this year, and that has affected the EPOS. And that's partly because a number of employees exercise share options. The exercise of share options brought with them a, a charge to the corporation tax, which isn't reflected in the charge to the company. So the share-based payment charge was much lower than the actual benefit we got, tax benefit we got from issuing those options. A bit of a nuance there, but that's a bit of a, well, I was going to say a one-off, but it will be a continuing feature to the extent when people exercise their options, we will end up with a lower corporation tax charge. So, so that's a main reason for that lower charge this year. We did have a prior year adjustment that affected last year. So there's a big swing there. Um, and that swing partly, the, not, the big improvements we had in the earnings per share is partly impacted by that. So, so the, it, it's up, if you like, and if more people exercise options and say in the second half or next year, again, there will be a similar benefit flowing through. And, and that's why we're seeing this big increase, higher increase than profit increase in the earnings per share um, in, in the operating profit. And just going back to that, when you look at 2014, the first chart on that, we're looking at a profit earnings per share that's five times, five times bigger than it was four years ago. In the, in the same period. I did mention about cash, um, and we have gone from an overdraft of 250,000 last year to nearly, nearly 2 million. The operations generated about 1.4 million, but we have increased working capital. There'll be a little slide on that at the moment to just show where we are now that, uh, to demonstrate that that is supporting growth and not out of control. Um, and we have spent a fair bit on capital expenditure more than we have done, and we flagged that up about, um, a year ago, we mentioned we were going to be investing in a high-speed filling line um, to ease capacity. We have done that. Um, that has increased the bottle filling capacity by about 25% in the business in the period. We have also um, committed to a high-speed tube filling line, which will be fully operational by the end of this calendar year, again, to ease capacity on the tube filling and give us additional capacity there. Um, so both of those are incremental to give the company the base to grow the business to move forward. And in fact, the high-speed bottle filling lines, um, we still think we've got more to deliver out of that, but it's made us think again about how we could actually do more with less, if you like, by um, replicating that in the future. So those, it's changed our thinking a little bit on how we will move forward. Again, a, a little bit more about that. And I just want to put in the point that we've got you know, we have utilised a fair bit of cash, but within our existing facilities, we've got £2.8 million worth of the headroom. So we can support another fair tranche of growth within our current facilities. Just to follow on working capital, stocks increased by 1.6 million, 28% up on last year. Sales are up 33%, but also the order book at the end of September is 42% higher than it was this time last year. 
and, and the order book, the future orders is often what's driving the cash into the business as we make the investment in the stock or driving the stock into the business. So the stock turn, when we look at our historic cost of sales for the last three months, has in, increased in slightly. So I think we're still managing to control the stock relative to the growth in business. And um, debtors is up by 21% compared to the same two months last year. So the last two months that are sitting in the debtor book, the sales are up 21%, debtors are up for 21%. Debtor days are slightly higher. Um, and um, we've got a little bit of work to do there, but a lot of that is mix of uh, customer base, but there's a bit to do to improve on that. And we, we are, again, as part of the plans, we're investing in um, the support parts of the business there to keep, main, maintain our and improve our cash turn on debtors. So largely working capital has been fairly tightly controlled, even though it has, we have g invested money to support the growth in the business. So about the finances, that's really given a bit of flesh to the background there, our background to where we are. I just wanted to touch on the operational plans we're looking at because it's been a big part of the businesses looking at how we achieve and support the growth. Um, we did bring in a new operations team who started with the business in uh, February and March last year and have started to get their feet under the table. It's a good example, this, um, because it, in it, it, in its, um, you know, as with all examples, it's at a, a point in time. Um, but the operational efficiency in the factory in October this year in Peterborough was 117%. The same time last year, it was 98%. So largely the same benchmark. So the team have got in there and they are driving efficiencies through through the business and giving us a bit more. And we get, we're getting a spin-off, which is quite interesting, is that the output is up in the factory, but actually the, 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 you can feel in the factory that it's under more control. And, and actually getting that efficiency is increasing capacity as well. So we're getting a benefit on unit cost and we're getting a benefit on more throughput within the timeframes and greater capacity. So I think it was a, you know, a, a, it's proved to be a good decision bringing someone in to concentrate on that part of the business. We are changing a little bit. I think as we get a bit bigger, we're formalising the way we're looking at how we invest in people. Um, and we're looking at um, a more formalised structure on the shop floor in particular um, it, it, to, to assess performance and try and reward individual performance rather than have a one a one case fits all for people on the shop floor. So identify people that go the extra mile reward them for them, performance appraise them and move them. So we're moving to try and recognise people and develop our own people to give us the capacity to move forward. Um, there has been a focus on driving more output out of the equipment. I think that's continuing. Um, and we're also looking across the shift patterns at the moment to try and look at how we build a shift pattern that will take us to the next stage. And we're always in the time there looking at, you know, our aspiration of 60 million by 2020. So we've still got to cope with another, you know, 15% per annum growth over the next few years. So we're looking at trying to build that. I mentioned about the outsource to the, the third party logistics organization. We've, we're 90% through that. There's a little bit more to do that. And once we've done that, we'll be able to start making some operational savings in house as we reallocate people within the business. Um, the high speed bottle line in, it is delivering 25%. It's delivering a mar marginal improvement in efficiency, but we will get better and drive that more. And the high speed tube filler comes in in December. And again, that will increase output by 20%, but will also, um, is designed to give us a, an operational benefit and a, a, a reduce the unit cost as well, because it's a more uh, automated machine. Hopefully that's given you a flavor for what's going on around behind the business to support the sales growth that, uh, Pippa is, de is delivering. <laughs> Afternoon. For those who don't know me, uh, Pippa Clark. I head up our sales and marketing functions um, across the group at Crichton's. Um, just wanted to give you some context of the market that we're operating in and give you some updated numbers. Um, health and beauty continues to outpace other FMCG categories in the UK. It's had a 9% growth over the past few years, which has been interesting in terms of how that is evolving and developing with different retailers but also is giving us lots of opportunities. UK is now the sixth largest personal care market um, globally at 10.2 billion. 
We spend about £155 per capita, which makes us the fifth largest per capita spend globally. It's a very healthy market. Obviously, lots of talk about digital and online, particularly in this space. Um, but bricks and mortar is still, is still key. It's not going to go away. It's evolving and it's changing. And there are some winners and some losers. Um, but the consumer in health and beauty still likes to look, touch, feel and see the product. Um, what we're finding actually is even though one in three UK consumers are buying beauty online over the past 12 months, a lot of what they're buying is actually repeat buying. So they're often buying first in store bricks and mortar and then they'll shop online and for convenience will buy online. So still both channels very important, but just changing. So who are those winners? Um, specialists globally are doing very well. Boots Superdrug um, doing very well in the UK. Sephora Ulta, definitely the darlings of the industry in the US. Olive Young in Korea is a good example. And Nadi in Saudi Arabia, a 1200 chain um, boots style pharmacy operation in Saudi. Um, online and digital, obviously the Huck Group continues to do incredibly well. Makeup Revolution is another brand that's come through online very successfully over the past 12 to 18 months. Discount Grocery continuing to do very well. We all know about the fortunes of Aldi, but actually Kaufland also coming out of Germany, about to launch in Australia, also doing very well. And then what we classify as sophisticated discounters, Home Bargains here in the UK, headed up by Tommy Morris and Normal in Denmark, who also happens to be a, a very successful customer for us, doing very well in that market. And then the losers in terms of, um, not just in terms of retail, but in terms of our categories as well. Um, obviously, we all know the fortunes of House of Fraser, Debenhams, and John Lewis also struggling as well. Um, and then the pound shops with Pound World and Pound Stretcher. I think what's interesting with those department stores, even though they've been struggling um, in their totality, all three of those over the past two years have invested in beauty significantly. Um, I don't think, unfortunately, it's done enough to rescue those businesses necessarily, but it's interesting that they see the health and beauty category as one which, you know, absolutely has opportunity for them to make margin and to grow. So in terms of our division performance, um, those of you that are familiar with our business and in the appendices of the presentation, there's a lot more detail on how we're structured. We have three divisions, contract manufacturing, where we manufacture for other brands, private label, where we're working direct to retail, and manufacturing and developing their brands and then brands that we own. So looking at the six months in 2017 versus the six, first six months of 2018, just wanted to show you the difference in terms of how the business is split up. Um, contract manufacturing, um, private label, pacing very well, still very dominant in terms of what we do. Private label over the past six months compared to 2017 has had a 61% uplift in sales. Now represents 43% of our total business. Contract manufacturing at 34% of our total business with a 20% increase in sales six months on the six months. And then our owned brands, 23% of what we do in total, but still pacing at 13% growth from the six months in 2017. Just a little bit more about the order book, which Paul touched on in his financial presentation, just to give you a little bit more context. The average order intake in April to September 2017 was 2.9 million a month and has now moved in the first six months of this year to 3.9 million, so 34% growth. And the average total order book, and our order book usually stretches over about a four month period, um, has moved from about 6.5 million to 8.4 million. So again, a 29% growth in, in average order book, six months on the six months. So you can see the context of how the business is pacing and moving in terms of how the order book is driving the business. Key drivers as to why we believe we've had the success over this first six months of this financial year is partnering with winning brands and retailers. Um, we are fortunate that we are working with some really positive brands that are doing very well globally and we're manufacturing for them. And they are growing quite significantly. And because we're manufacturing, we're getting the benefit of that and partnering well with them. And also with some key retailers in the UK and globally. So that gives us lots of new opportunities, partnering with the right retailers. And it also gives us a nice repeat order book as they succeed. Consumer insight is another key pillar for us in terms of why we're driving the business. And we focus on the right products with the right retailers. So whether that's working with a home bargains in the sophisticated discount sector or with Aldi in, in um, discount grocery 
or working with someone like Primark in the fashion sector, it's about understanding the right kind of products that they're going to sell to their consumer and understanding their consumer and what they want. Agility and dependability um, is another key factor for us. That has definitely been a feature of why our private label growth has come over the past six months. We have the ability to move quite quickly. We're very agile in terms of working to what the customer needs and also continuing to maintain our service levels. Um, those of you that have seen us present before, the mantra in our business is quality service and innovation and continuing to deliver on that service element of that mantra is very important in terms of enabling those retailers to grow this category. And team investment, um, Paul touched on how that's a priority for us now within the production environment. We've been working very successfully with a graduate program in the rest of our business for some years now, whether that be sales and marketing, purchasing, customer services, R&D. And investing in those graduates and bringing them through the business is, is really paying dividends for us in terms of building a sustainable team moving forward. And we're focusing on internal promotions. Um, we're finding that growing our own and investing in them is actually giving us much better payback than often bringing in new individuals. So we're keeping focused on investing in that, that young, dynamic and growing team. Wanted to give you a bit more information on where our brands are going. As you know, for a number of years, we've traded our brands very successfully under the Crichton's name within the discount sector in the UK. And we enable to move the profile of the, the retail of those products globally quite significantly. But our priority over the past 18 to 24 months has been on developing brands that will move us up the retail price chain um, and into different types of retailers. And those three key brands are the Curl Company, Feather and Down, and to be launched in February of next year, Bam Beautiful. And these are going, we're really focusing on these brands and they're doing very well in terms of, of growing within the UK and global markets. So the Curl Company has now been moved up to a thousand store distribution within Boots. That's quite exciting because we were at 90 stores in Boots for about two years. Um, they then identified through their um, Advantage card data that we were bringing a lot of new consumers to Fixture, which is a very important um, driver for Boots and moved us up to 500 stores, and then within two months, moved it up to 1,000 stores. So that's quite exciting for the brand. We've also launched in Morrisons over the past two months, and we've had confirmation that we're moving into Asda in February with the brand. So we've literally gone from 90 stores on this brand pretty much 18 months ago to having three key retailers and moving up quite significantly in store numbers. Feather and Down, um, we launched exclusively in Boots 18 months ago. We have now just launched with Sainsbury's. We've maintained our Boots listing. We have more space in Boots. We've gone to three shelves and up to 300 stores from the original 150. And we've just launched into 150 Sainsbury's stores. Um, the data from the first three week sales is looking very positive. So very excited about moving that brand forward with Sainsbury's. And then Bam Beautiful. And the key here for Bam Beautiful for us is to continue moving into the wellbeing sector in health and beauty. Feather and Down was really our first brand that went into well-being, focusing on sleep. And we're now moving into um, tackling hair loss issues in women, hair thinning and hair loss issues in women with a product that is all natural. Um, I'm very excited about this launch that's coming up in February of next year. Another key feature of Bam Beautiful is that we're moving the retails quite significantly. So Curl and Feather and Down have moved us from kind of five to 15 pounds. Bam Beautiful moves us from 10 to 25 pounds. So it's about bringing brands into the portfolio and innovating brands that move us up that retail platform. So the journey continues for us um, in terms of sales and marketing drivers in the business. And these are the key focuses over the next six months, continuing to work on margin. Um, efficiencies obviously through the operations and through the factory, but also in terms of product cost engineering. We have also gone to the market with some retailers on price increases as well. Um, and we've had some success there as well. That's always a balancing act, as you can imagine, but is also a driver for us. Digital is now very much on the agenda for us. We've invested in um, a digital marketing manager and we've also invested um, in a new platform, which we hope to be launching about February of next year. Um, and this will give us a platform in terms of digital technology that will allow us to trade globally pretty seamlessly. So it's quite an efficient way of getting to that market. 
Export markets, very much still on the agenda for us. Um, the USA market is one that we've wanted to go back into for some time. We have now made a resource investment in terms of a sales manager going into the US market for us. So I'd hope that in six months time, we'll be sitting here and talking about how the US market is developing for us. So that's very much on the agenda. <laughs> Global sourcing, again, we've invested in um, people resource, focusing specifically on global resourcing. Um, part of the driver is obviously what's happening with Brexit, and we want to reduce our reliance on Europe in terms of what we do and what componentry we buy through Europe. But also, we want to take the opportunity to go more global with our sourcing so that we can get price benefits on componentry. Um, she's been in play now for about three months, and in terms of what we're able to achieve and the vision that we've now got in terms of what we can um, cost save in terms of componentry, it's really quite exciting. Not just from China, but we're looking at other markets around the world in terms of componentry as well. And that again is focusing on our margin improvement agenda piece that we have. And then Brexit planning. Um, we've been looking at Brexit now in terms of what that means for our business for the past few months. We've got a cross-functional team in the business that meets every week. We've been working very closely with customers. Um, we have been successful actually in working with the brands that we work with in getting advanced order books from them. So where we would normally get a two to month order book from them, we've extended that and they've extended with us by about four to five months to get us over that kind of March hump that is going to happen at some point. <laughs> um, so that's giving us a bit more visibility and the ability to order componentry based on their order book. Um, we've also partnered with a number of our key retailers so where we do private label, they've underwritten more componentry than they would normally underwrite. So again, we've worked very closely with them to extend that period of time, which enables us to bring more stock in as a buffer around that time period, just to try and hopefully smooth things for us. And then the flip side of that is working with key suppliers, um, particularly out of Europe. Um, a lot of our raw materials come through Europe. Um, a lot of our tubes come through Europe, but also in the UK too. Plastics industry here in the UK buys the majority of its plastic from Europe. So it's making sure that those key suppliers are focused on building buffers and ensuring that they've got continuity of supply, depending on what or what may not happen in March. So it's just trying to keep as, as, as up to date as we can with what our suppliers are doing, hooking in very closely with our customers in terms of visibility on orders and what they might need, and just trying to kind of get some more visibility into, into the business so that we can hopefully manage that period of time with some success. So I'm now going to hand back over to Bernard, who is going to do a summary for you on our aspirations moving forward. Okay, thank you, Pippa. Thanks for bearing with us so far, ladies and gentlemen. And I just want to sum summarize, uh, because we kind of state our aspirations each time we present to you. Sometimes you laugh, sometimes you cry. Hopefully, um, uh, you'll believe us um, in the longer term. But basically, our current setup is based on the fact that restructured, we have restructured manufacturing. We've reorganized warehousing. We are installing and have installed high-speed machinery with extra production lines. We are moving the margin up the ladder but by better brands and also by cutting out costs and uh, renegotiating prices. And we feel that we have a base for sustainable and flexible organic growth. We have a great team on the marketing side, um, and we're investing also part of your money, I suppose, as well, in the sense that uh, we've issued share options to all of our employees. We feel our employees are, are, are our success, really. It's all about people. It's all about training them, motivating them, keeping them happy, and, and um, moving forward with them. And I think we have a great team and, and we're, we're well positioned now for growth. Our aspirations we set out uh, last time we talked and before that were 60 million by the end of uh, 2020, 5% uh, net profit after tax, 20% return in capital and 2% dividend. And I think we are well positioned to achieve those. I just wanted to reconfirm that uh, to you and, and um, Previously, we felt we had to make an acquisition, possibly, to get to 60 million. But actually, I think we can get there with, with organic growth, which, which is important. It kind of changed our thinking a bit on how we go forward with the company and, 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 and how we, we seek new investment, I suppose. 
Are, are, with a possible P-E ratio, that would value the company at, uh, by the end of 2020 or, or 30th, 31st of March 2021 at $42 million, which uh, is a lot more than it is now and obviously would increase the share price. So we want to be fairly prudent in how we go forward and what, how we seek new investment. I don't know what kind of message that gets across or how you interpret it, but um, for us, the current plan is therefore to continue with diversified growth across all sectors of our business, seeking out new sectors as well, because I think we're really good at taking opportunities when they come along without taking on necessary risks. So we would look to increase, for example, in well-being, you know, Bambutiful, for example, we would consider a well-being product, Feather and Don's a well-being product, but there are further, there's a further journey in that area to be taken. And uh, I, I think we are well positioned to do it, not just in hair care, but in skin care and in other areas. We are uh, well set to drive up our efficiencies and margins, better buying, global buying, more efficient team. Uh, so so that, that's, that's a good message there as well. And based on st um, a stable structure, we feel we can reduce the overhead further as a percentage of sales. So I can't wait. quietly in the background, we're hoping for a 7% margin by 2021, by 31st of March, 2021, 2% uh, higher than it is now. And we feel confident enough to state that at this point in time and go for it and be held out to dry, of course, if we don't make it. Um, in, in these results, we've also given a 5% bonus right across the company, as well as individual bonuses. So, um, and we've, we've uh, given a 5% pay increase. So we're looking after our employees, hopefully looking after our shareholders, as well as keeping a very rounded approach to the market. So uh, we also aim to, to be as responsible as we can be for sustainability um, and, and, the, and looking after the environment. So we intend to invest quite a bit of money in that, which will drive down our overheads as well after the initial investment. We will be a more efficient company with employees who have an interest in the value of the company as well as just their pay packet at the end of the, of the, of the uh, week. So basically that's our, our presentation. Hopefully it gives you a feel for the culture we're trying to develop and the way we're positioned to go forward. So thank you very much. Thanks for being patient. <laughs> very kind of you. So we're all set for questions. We want you to make them hard and difficult. Brian Geary, um, just a question on sort of operational gearing. So revenues great up uh, 33% and profit up 44%. But one figure that stands out um, is, is distribution. Um, so it was up 65% in the half year. Is that mainly a function of outsourcing or is it a function of the type of distribution with the, the rise no. in private label? No, it's primarily the outsourcing. Um, the, the, there may be some small in, uh, mixing increases, but in, in reality, actually, the most expensive product to distribute are branded products. So, so it isn't necessarily the, the, uh, the growth in the branded. It's primarily the outsourcing. And it's partly we've got a double whammy in that period because we have got some incremental costs because we've not managed to take all of the resources or reallocate the resources internally whilst we've been doing the transition to outsourcing. So we anticipate some of that percentage increase falling away over the next six to 12 months as we uh, balance the internal overheads. And does that distribution cost incorporate the external uh, yes. warehousing? Yes, it does. Okay. okay so. yeah. All right, thank you. Um, Sam Morland, I've, if it's possible, I've got three quick questions. One is on the um, sales growth, very impressive on the private label side. How concentrated is that among the number of customers? That's three key customers driving that. Right. Um, all very, what I would put in the winning category of retailers, and that's just a good example of working with the right retailers. Um, so that's, yeah, it's right. cost, it's okay. cost that, Sorry, then the second question was, um, you mentioned that the order intake was up 41%, and Pippa, you also mentioned that the order book was, or 
your clients were working with you to get longer yes. because of Brexit. Yes. Does that mean that, in a sense, the real order book is up less than that 41%? And what, uh, no, we... because it wasn't reflected in that six-month period that we're reporting on. Okay. It's this second six-month period that we're now moving into. That um, Obviously, we're monitoring base order book, if you like, and what's been put on top. So when we report in six months' time, We'll obviously explain the difference between where that inflation, if you like, it's been slightly been inflated, but not in those numbers because that's the six months to September where that hasn't been impacted. Understood. And then the third there question was... There have been an element of the customer, the customer increasing on their own decision to increase for Brexit, but not, a, not, not by our right. initiation. Sorry. And then the third question, just quickly on the cash flow. Um, would you... Uh, do you see a time when this sort of expansion of the working capital will stop because H2, things like Brexit, um, outsourcing to the Far East, also and things like that will increase demand for working capital. Is that correct? Or? Um, certainly where we're standing at the moment, we, we're looking at about a £400,000 investment in inventory to cover our Brexit commitments, which will happen in the second second half of the year. As soon as we have some certainty on what's happening, because our main planning at this time on that is disruption to supply chain from Europe. That's where our concentration of effort is, um, whether it be our supply chain, our customers' supply chain, or, or, or our um, suppliers themselves. So that's where we've been putting our efforts. So we, we, that's the figure we're working on. Uh, some of that is committed now. Some of that is um, not yet committed. We've identified lead times when we will need to, and we'll unravel that as soon as we can. Um, the majority of the growth is that as we do make to order stock we do have to carry inventory and of course customers require trade terms so there will be a debtor so you know roughly speaking we're talking a, a, you know it, it varies by customer but we're probably talking about a three three hundred thousand pound investment for every million pounds worth of increased turnover that we are to make to make to order so if we continue to grow we'll continue to need need more cash to support working capital but equally we're starting we're generating profits as well um, so we've reached a level now where if, if the product stabilised, then the growth stabilises and the cash would start coming through. So it, it's, it's, it's... We, cut the, we, we work by ratios, so the, the stock turn is, is 4.2 instead of 4. So there's a slight improvement in the stock turn, even though we've had these issues in, in rationalising production. So we, we, we're hoping to get the stock turn to maybe 4.3, 4.5. If we, incre if we double our business or increase to 60 million, we'll still have an extra stock. We'll still have to finance the stock. We'll, we'll have to finance debtors. So we don't expect any, any kind of ease, easy pressure on to be generating any more cash. Mm -hmm. I think also we want to uh, make sure the factory, that we can do 60 million within the same premises as we have now without buying a new factory or without extending. So that means some investment in, in just the walls of the factory, the floor of the factory, things like that. So we don't expect, we're not dressing the company for sale or, or to generate cash. We're, 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 we're dressing it up or, or improving it for long-term growth. Roger Derry, Roger. you've talked quite a lot about margin improvement. Yep. In your three divisions, you've got contract manufacturing, private label and own brand, where I would assume the margins are best, but the growth is in the private label. Is that where margin is that going to help move your margins or um, if you pick the right retailers and do the right set of products there's good margin to bad in private label there's also quite bad margin to be had in private label if you're operating with the wrong retailers and in the very value end of the market um, one of the retailers that we've grown with quite significantly over the past six months in fact over the past 18 months but particularly the last six months we're very much doing added value products and the margins are very healthy so it is about working with the right retailers in the right products to get the margin. And that growth is happening in the right place? Or what it is about for us at the moment. For us at brand? the moment, it is, yeah. 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 And margin in own brand? In terms of brands that we own? Yeah, I mean, margin, you're quite right. In brands that you own, the more that we move up the retail chain in terms of retail price point, absolutely, there's more margin to be had. But on the flip side of that, you also have all the costs of marketing and promotion, and you bear everything that comes with promoting that brand. So obviously you have to start at a much higher point in terms of your gross margins on brands that you own, but then obviously you are in control of the spend that you make on that. Um, and yes, we have moved margin forward in our own brands because we are moving forward with brands 
moving ourselves, if you like, out of that reliance on the discount sector that we have been in for the past number of years and moving into retailers and margin price, uh, retail price points that are higher that allows us to, to move the margins up. We also feel that the, these kind of brands build equity in the company. You know, there, there is a value in the brand. We, we have in the past sold brands before, but those brands were probably done not, not as, not as, as, as high in the, in the um, chain, in the margin chain as these products. And I, I would expect us to be building good value in the, those brands. So, so which area would you like to prioritize? All of them. All of them. And, and I think what's interesting is there, because there's swings and roundabouts. And the, one of the reasons we like what I call our three-legged stool is that some years, I mean, private label went through the doldrums, really, you know, over the past five years. It's coming back in a big way because it's, it's on the agenda of retailers. Retailers are backing off brands at the moment because they're all price fighting. So they've decided that there's no margin to be had in big brands because they're all price fighting. So now they all want to go back into private label because that's where they think they, they can make money. They want exclusivity. They want customers coming in for products that they can't buy elsewhere. I guarantee you in another 18 months, they'll all swing back to brand. So we quite like having the three-legged stool because it's about being able to be agile and be able to take advantage. So if you, if you looked at our numbers and our balance of our division two years ago, contract manufacturing was the big growth for us. Now it's been private label. Brands keep growing at a very steady rate because we're investing and obviously there's a, there's a bit of a longer lead time, if you like, on building those brands. But as long as we keep that steady growth, that will continue to sustain. So yeah, all three areas are important to us. Two questions, um, one around CapEx and the other around um, uh, where's the growth going to come from? Um, and so on that second question, um, I'm wondering, is it going to be expanding these existing brands? I'm thinking this specifically these brands. Is it going to be expanding these existing brands into more outlets? Or is it going to be, as you alluded to, more products that are maybe £40 price mark or whatever the next level is, 30 And on the CapEx point, um, you alluded to more investment in um, pipe, in uh, uh, filling lines, etc. So could you um, enlarge on that a little bit? Uh, you, Sorry. You, you, go, uh, you go first, yeah. Well, if I go first, it's on the, on the CapEx side. Um, roughly speaking, the uh, new filling line we put in by the, will, will have cost about 250,000 and the new tube line's a similar sort of price. And both of those, so, so for half a million pounds, we've increased the capacity in those two production areas, you know, by between 20 and 25% with, with our current um, shift pattern. And um, what part of the strategy there is also being able to l put us in a position where we could do more out of those lines and do um, a, a, and therefore reduce the uh, number of lines as well. So we're trying to look to the future in terms of whether we can do more in the f less, if you like. Bernard said about doing more in the same footprint. And that's our goal. We're looking at sort of, you know, way out into the future about being able to achieve that. So in, in terms of overall scale, we're talking about ha half a million pounds was virtually... Uh, increased our capacity by roughly 20%. Um, we did increase our jar filling capacity as well, which I didn't really mention very much there, but that was largely utilising existing equipment from other parts, as part of the Devon operation, we had underutilised equipment, and also by um, renting some labour. So there will be a little bit more equipment purchases as we go ahead this year. Um, and the next year, what we're looking at is if these are successful, they deliver on the results, is how we could maybe adapt them to do, bring more of our production and maybe take a shift out, you know, so do two shifts, start reducing our reliance on shifts and all the costs associated with that. We've got to look at where, where the growth comes from and, where the, uh, and how quickly that comes over time. But we're trying to position ourselves to be flexible on a shifting pattern that we can flex more quickly around the capabilities of the equipment. There's also a little bit of a driver on labour. Labour is, you know, like a lot of UK manufacturing business, we've relied upon relatively cheap EU labour. That, that's going to sort of dry up. So we've got to start positioning ourselves, looking at how we can do more um, with less labour over the longer term. If we could do a third more with the same number of people, we need to recruit less. We're very, we are reliant on, on immigrant labour as well. So I see that as a driver. The more the more high speed machinery we have, and the less need we have per uh, per labour per unit, 
the less reliant we are on on the immigrant labour, which is a, an important consideration at the minute. If the BAM Beautiful product range does well, as you hope, next year, would you have to face a decision in terms of capex and limited resource allocation to the expansion of this new product at the expense of your other two sort of lines? And would that cause problems with your existing customers? And would we expect to get some restructuring costs coming through your PNL because you've had to restructure? To accommodate a new product launch. No, I, the um, uh, in terms of in, in the uh, the pressure on the on the manufacturing yes. resource yes. on the factory resource, yes. that wouldn't be a problem um, at all. And and even at the at the very at the very worst, you could subcontract manufacturing that to some someone else. I mean the 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 the, the costs in that is is getting it listed, paying for listing fees, paying for promotional costs. The actual cost of production is is relatively small, and wouldn't put you know that could become a twenty million turnover product uh, without putting too much pressure on the manufacturing resource. Bruce, did we answer the second part of your question? No, where okay. the growth is coming from yeah. is the second question. Yes. So, um, in terms of our own brands, we would like to get more out of the brands that we've got. We put a lot of new product development into particularly these three brands over the past couple of years. There's a little bit more coming here, um, but this is more about adding a few products just to kind of round off the, you know, as you start to trade brands, you learn what your winners are, what your market's like. Um, this is a big target for us for the US market. It's kind of two products that we didn't have in the lineup that are very specific to the US market we're adding in. Um, Feather and Down, we're moving very much into the gifting arena. So it'll be, it'll be about evolving that brand. So whilst that now sits in the indulgence uh, bathing space with both Boots and Sainsbury's, um, we've got a whole gift program for next Christmas. So that will be expanding that brand. So getting more out of that brand. And then obviously Bam Beautiful is brand new. Um, so I would hope, you know, for the next two years. So the goal on all three of these, absolutely, whether it's within the UK or whether it's global markets, and we've identified as I, as I outlined earlier, winners globally that we would like to work with with each of these brands um, and working with the export team and the sales team on, on getting the attention of those retailers so that we can get these things launched. That doesn't mean new product development won't come, um, particularly when we've referred to going into other sectors, whether it's well-being or whether it's colour cosmetics or whether it's skin care, more skincare or whatever it might be. So there's always something going on behind the scenes in terms of what's the next big trend and what's the next thing we want to do in hair care. Um, but definitely the next 12 months, our focus as a particularly a branded marketing sales team is, is these three brands in terms of pushing, getting more out of these three brands for sure. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Hi, it's uh, Matthew McEachern. A uh, few questions from me, if that's okay. Can we just come back to the gross margin and talk a little bit about, you know, the, the kind of input cost inflation? I mean, it sounds like you've got some, some line efficiency uh, mitigations coming through, but on the kind of on the imported um, pressures and also on the componentry pressures, I mean, are they are they significant? Have they risen? Do you think they're starting to fade? And will they outweigh the efficiencies? Do you expect some 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 gross margin erosion before mixed benefits? Um, we've been very fortunate that due to our growth, we've had some great volume benefits in terms of purchasing. Our purchasing team are doing incredibly well. Um, we've invested a lot in them in terms of training and development over the past couple of years, and it's really paying off. So that has driven improvements in gross margin in all three areas. Um, obviously, very conscious of the Brexit European dynamic and the assumption there is that there will be pressure on cost at some point. Hence, our drive for a global agenda in terms of sourcing, um, whether that be from Turkey, whether that be from China, whether that be from South Korea. We're looking at different markets around the world for componentry. Um, and there are savings to be had. We do buy quite a bit from China at the moment, but mainly through agents. So our goal is to now go direct and the savings that will come with that. So I would hope by having that global strategy combined with what might be happening coming out of Europe, that we can balance off the two. So we're very conscious of it, but it's just keeping everything working and everything moving yeah. to keep moving that forward. And cost engineering the products as well. We're always looking at our products. We have cross-functional teams. I already have a team on Feather and Down, cost engineering Feather and Down, and we've only had it for 18 months. 
So we've driven gross margin into this already. So, you know, when we first launched, because it was at speed, we went with one carton supplier. We've now moved carton suppliers to get saving because the range is, is now launched. So we're constantly looking at it in terms of, you know, improving margin. And you mentioned price increases earlier in the presentation, but, but that sounds like a last resort and an actual fact you're maybe yeah, and we've Holding done that, that mainly in the discount sector. Retailers? That's mainly that sector that we were operating in and have done quite successfully for some years. Just putting a bit more pressure on that sector in terms of pricing, because obviously pricing has been keen. Um, and yeah, so far not too bad actually. I would say that we've probably added at 200,000 uh, in the last six months. On bottom line, through on price bottom increases. Line, through price increases. Mm. Now we, we suffer, to some extent, we suffer because it challenges the, 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 the customer, but uh, it also puts the thing in perspective with the customer and, and as long as we keep within the parameters of the market and don't and we're still competitive we know that the other the other manufacturers are putting price are under the same price pressures but we might be just a little bit more nimble and agile okay thanks for that and then um there, there seems to be some early signs potentially that um certain large um e-commerce groups are effectively going a bit more vertically integrated in the space I mean, you, you, you serve some of these customers. Is there any evidence from your end that they're kind of bringing stuff in-house or not? Or Very much. Yeah. The assumption is they will. The, yeah. the, it's so a good assumption. I mean, uh, we're prepping for that. Hot, Hot yeah. Group bought Atchison Atchison, which is a company just slightly bigger than us doing the same things as us. And they, they, um, they purchased them, so we expect some kind of uh, spin-off from that. But, you know, uh, if we're careful, it, it'll work to our advantage as well. Okay, thanks. And then just one final question, just in relation to your aspiration slide. We talked about, you know, 14 times PE, you know, giving you a market cap. Is that that far? 14 various... times? Yeah, great modelling. I like that. <laughs> um, could you um, give us a sense as to what the PE of the business is today? Um, and, you know, whether or not you better you know, tell you're, me quickly, you're, you're basing the 14 times, what are you kind of basing that on? The standard in the market, really, 14 is not is a reasonable PE, and it's, it's there in, in across the the industry so that's that's what that 14 is based on and if you'd like to meet and what would be what's your p at the moment would that be a kind of it's about 10 i think 10, 10. 10. 10. I, okay. I feel i would feel very uncomfortable if it went above 14. okay i don't want to see it well it's not you know the market decides what it wants to do but i would feel uncomfortable if we're way up in dreamland you know like some of our competitors but um I'd be very comfortable with 14. i think it's a reasonable return okay. on, on Investment, CF. <laughs> Hi, uh, Kevin Taylor. Hi, Kevin. Uh, can I just ask some questions about the debt? Uh, as I look at the the average debt, I get the impression that the comparing that to the interest charge, you're getting charged around about 1.5 percent. Am I in the right ballpark? Yeah, approximately. Well, um, the margins around one and a half, one and okay. three quarter percent on the. Um, on the debt. The debt has grown through the period as we've grown the business, so it hasn't been at the current level all, all the way through. But, second but the second question, yeah. uh, you said that you had room of 1.7 million in the, two, under two, the facilities? 2.7 at the point. 2.7, yeah, okay. 2 .7. But the, the total debt's grown by almost 2 million in the six month period. Mm -hmm. is, is that gonna be adequate? space it will certainly covers us through for the next um well as for the foreseeable future our facilities are due for renewal in uh, okay and that, that was gonna be February. my final question because they're all showing short-term borrowings yes and we are we have a, it is a working capital facility that we've largely got in place we are refinancing some of the capital equipment on a hp facility over a five-year term so by the time we come to march some of this big spend on capital expenditure will be refinanced on a HP facility. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, it's David Barry. Um, just a question about your seasonality. Yeah, absent any growth, presumably your, your profits are weighted to the second half, is that right? Pardon? In the absence of any growth, your profits would be weighted to the second half of the year, is that correct? No, no, I don't no, think so. seasonal business. Okay. We, we've ceased to be, see, yeah. we were very seasonal at one time, probably 10 years ago. And, and over the last 10 years, we, we've kind of moved away from it yeah. by intent and by accident as, as much as anything else. So I don't think we're seasonal anymore. We would expect the same kind of result in the second half. Okay. And, and then on your uh, aspirations, th those are now for 7%. Uh, that's, is... that's a dream. That's not a, kind of, I, I should have changed that word to dream. Aspirations 5, 
but I think we can hike away at the overheads, improve our efficiencies, and have that at 7% by 2021. Okay, well, on that basis, then, your 14 PE would make you 58.8 million market cap. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a dream. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you ever consider moving to the, to the AIM uh, AIM market? We went through that, uh, and, uh, you know, Matthew, well, no, we, we, we've talked to people, and we've talked to Matthew and, and his... I, I just... I think we've better things to do than worry about that. I think, you know, we're not that desperate for capital or for attracting. We would like to see the share price and people still interested in the shares. But we find that when we were taking our eyes off the ball, suddenly, our, our, you know, we've got a factory problem, uh, which, which we announced to the market and over, we've overcome it. But we don't want to make that mistake again. Of, I mean, it just takes time. I don't, the only benefit I can see in the, in the for me, um, as well as for other shareholders, um, is is um, is the inheritance tax position, but other than that, uh, there's there's not a big benefit as far as I can see in moving to the aim. We have considered it as the answer to the question, and if if we were um, advised to do it, overwhelmingly we would do it. But um, and in fact, our our chief shareholder would like to do it, but we don't feel as a team that. It's worth getting into that at the minute. I'd rather drive for 2021 and, and have 60 plus million, 7% in the bottom line and the value of the company, no matter what exchange it's on, to, to be at the, at the 58 or the 45 or whatever, whatever we can get to. Does that answer the question? Yes, Maybe. it does. Thanks very much. Okay. And congratulations on these. Results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's Brian Gear again. Just. Uh, Back in your last presentation, I think you had said about the private label growth largely being related to, I suppose, onshoring related to Brexit. You didn't mention that specifically this time, but what I'm trying to get a feeling for is is how much of it is is related to that point, and you know, is it is it one time buys or is it? Um, do they do the customers feel that there's a, a real benefit in buying UK brands or U, UK manufactured goods for UK shops, um, and therefore, you know, if they feel there are gen, genuine benefits rather than a de-risking related to political events, it's more stable. Um, when we um, highlighted that before, when we presented before, there were briefs coming into us that were directly related to. European manufacturers and retailers considering onshoring to the UK. Some of those came to fruition, some didn't. So actually some retailers have kept their supply in Europe. That appears bizarrely to have slowed down. The growth that we've experienced in the past six months has actually come from us proactively going to these retailers with new concepts and innovation and new price points um, and new opportunities. And that's really what's, what's driven the growth for us. A uh, small element of onshoring, whether or not that will that will accelerate again, I don't know. Um, definitely get the impression for some of the retailers they're just holding fire at the moment because they are as uncertain as everybody else is in terms of what might happen. Um, so yes, there was almost a, a small wave of it when we, last, when we last presented that has kind of gone through and hasn't really, hasn't really kind of surfaced again. So we'll see how that, how that plays out. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.